uh, we're, we're starting this new series today called uh, Money Mirror. And uh, at the end of our talk today, I'm going to um, open up and we're just going to take a little time for, for text in questions. This is the number. Um, you can go ahead and get that in your phone in case you have questions because I really do want to field questions at the end of this talk. Um, if you send me something stupid, I'm going to read it out loud and say your name. Yeah? All right. I'm just kidding. You'd be surprised all the texts I get um, when we open up uh, all the things that are said to me that probably shouldn't be sent to me. All right. <laughs> Anyways, um, I, I'm just kidding. I, I do want you, though, to grab a hold of that number. And uh, if you have a question about what is said or what we're, we're talking about, I really do want you to text it in. I won't call your name. Just kidding about that. All right? So uh, we'll do that at the end. That's, that's the number that you can text your questions into. Okay? So uh, whenever – here's the scoop. <clears throat> in church – Whenever we begin to have a conversation about money, it gets a little tense, all right? Let's just put that out right up front. It just gets a little tense um, because um, people are, and I would even say um, rightfully so in many cases, skeptical, right? Um, because oftentimes when the church talks about money, uh, you know, I mean, we immediately go to um, the excesses and the abuses that we've seen on the news. And so um, one thing we've just... We've really, as a church 180, we've committed to is, is to not be the church that every time you walk in our doors, we talk about money, talking about money, talking about money. I mean, I think we've said this before, but I used to, when I was a kid, I went to camp meeting. Anybody else go to camp meeting when you were a kid? Right? There was like 80 degrees in the, or 80 degrees, there was like 180 degrees in an aluminum building, and they always put it in July. You recall that? And then they would have this guy get up there and say, I feel like the Lord is saying we're going to raise $100,000 a night. Amen? <laughs> And then they would like not let you leave until they raise a hundred thousand dollars. So they do their first offering is like ten thousand dollars, and you're like, "Cost, you know?" Because you know they're going to stand there until they like they just beat the crap out of everybody in front. Like just to get the hell out of here. I wasn't sorry about that. Just to get out of here, I'm just going to give money, right? And so, anyways, it's just ridiculous. We're not going to do that. We're just not going to be that kind of a church. Um, so uh, we're not. Today, we're not going to ask you to give. We're not going to use the T word. We're not talking about tithes. Everybody just say, that's good. Uh, we're going to do that next week, okay? Um, and now that you know that, I want you to look around and see if they're here next week. All right, go ahead and do that. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, here's the thing about money. Let's just let's talk about money for a minute. Like, when we, we grin when we get more, right? Like, if your boss says, hey, I'm going to give you a raise, you're like, yeah. <laughs> Right? Um, we stress when we don't have enough. We, we plot how to grow our money. Uh, we talk about money. We pray about money. We think about money. We even obsess about money. Um, here's the thing. Jesus actually said that money is God's biggest competition. Did you know that? Like money is God's biggest competition. Um, this is what he says in Matthew 6, 24. You can't serve both God and money. He didn't say you can't serve God and Satan. He didn't say you can't serve God and your job. He said you can't serve God and money. And, and let me just think about that. Let me just throw it out, out there. Like, what do you, be honest, you don't have to say it out loud, but what do, you, what do you talk about more? What do you think about more, God or money? And, and, and the answer to that, if we're honest with ourselves, the answer to that ought to persuade us that maybe Jesus was right. Money is God's biggest competition for our attention, for our energy, for our passion, for our decisions. Now, all of this that we're saying is, is kind of weird because um, money doesn't make noise, does it? Have you ever lost a 20 and like you can't find it anywhere? And you really do need that money, but it doesn't make any noise. It lies silent. Um, money doesn't have free will. It can't make decisions. It doesn't have hands. Um, it doesn't speak. Um, I mean, I don't think it does. So I actually wanted to do something this morning. I have a little bit of money uh, in my pocket, and I wanted to just take a minute, and we're going to do something. Uh, I'm going to use this mic. Um, I'm gonna, I want you guys to be really, really quiet. Apparently they didn't get the signal, all right? Um, which, by the way, I love all that noise over there. You know what that means? It means there's like 30 kids over there having a great time right now, and I like that a lot. But they ought to be quiet so we can hear if money talks. Let's just go ahead and listen.
got nothing. Let's let's do this. Got nothing. So here's the scoop. Um, some people have said that I'm getting older, and so um, it could be that my hearing's gone. Right. So here's what I want to do. Um, dude, I completely forget the name. Kyle. Kyle. What's up, Kyle? Yeah. You're how old are you, Kyle? Uh, Take that. Thirty-three. You're thirty-three. So you're young. <laughs> yeah. All right. How old's your wife? Thirty. Oh, give it to her. <laughs> she wouldn't want to do it. She would want. Right, so what I want you to do is I want you to listen to that and see if you can hear. I'd put it right up to your ear. Like stick it right up there and, and let me know if you hear anything. Sounds like the ocean. Sounds like the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> And it sounds like a beach house. <laughs> Is it saying anything? <laughs> Nothing. It's, I'll tell you what, it's probably a bad $20 bill, so you go ahead and keep that, okay? Uh, let's do this. Um, let's do this right here. What's your name? Damien. Damien. How old are you, Damien? 43. You're pretty old. Um, give it to your daughter. <laughs> Emily, how old are you? Oh, wait a minute. Your name's a, What's your name? <laughs> I know what it is, nobody else knows what it is. Right, Emily? How old are you, Emily? Put that up to your mouth so we can hear you. 13. Alright, here's another $20 bill. So what I want you to do is I want you to take that and put it right up to your wall. I'm going to be really quiet and you tell me if you hear anything. Sounds like paper. <laughs> Emily, paper doesn't make a noise. I'm just kidding. It must be a bad $20 bill. You go ahead and keep that. Okay, uh, let me see here. Who else we got? What's this? It's Matt, right? Right, so um, you're Matt. Take that right there. Um, Matt, so here's all I got. I got like nine dollars left. Okay, dudes. Um, so what I want you to do is I want you to put that microphone right up there in your mouth and tell us how old you are. Twelve. Twelve. And um, so I want you to take this nine dollars and I want you to put it really close to your. Don't lie to me, Matt. Can you hear anything? Is it saying anything? No. Are you sure? Or are you just trying to get nine dollars? <laughs> all right, give me my nine dollars back. I'm kidding. You can it. <laughs> so what we have here is we have a, we have. Um, we have me, I'm 42, we have um, Je Jesse, uh, oh, Kyle, I'm not close now, <laughs> 33, he could be kind of old, so maybe your hair is gone. You owe him another 20. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm Paul, dude, I'm so sorry. I'm so, I'm so and then Matt, you're 12. And, and so what we have here is, we have this um, diversity of group, Emily's 12. Like, none of us actually heard money talk. We didn't hear it make any noise. Now. Here's the thing about money. Money is silent. No. <laughs> yes, it is. Silent until. <laughs> Are you gonna do that again? Are we gonna go ahead? It's totally kidding. Money is silent until it is in your hands and then it begins to speak. Money is absolutely silent until it is in your hands and then it begins to talk. Money tells a story once it's in your hand. It tells your story. Now, see, here's the thing. You could not tell anything about Kyle. <laughs> so you couldn't tell anything about Kyle based on the way I spend my money, could you? But if you watch the way Kyle spends his money, you might be able to tell some things about Kyle because money tells a story. Money tells a story of the person in whose hands it finds itself. Money tells your story. So there's a guy named uh, James W. Frick, and he said this. Frick is such an awesome name, isn't it? Like, what the Frick, right? That's so cool. Um, anyways, let's not get carried away. He said, uh, could you put my slides on the back screen, please? Otherwise, I have no idea where I'm at. He said, um, don't tell me what your priorities are. Show me where you spend your money, and I'll tell you what they are. So money is absolutely quiet. It doesn't speak. It's silent until it's in your hand, and then it starts to tell a story. It tells your story. It tells what's important to you. It tells what you think is important. It tells about your priorities. It tells about your values. So this is uh, James W. Frick. Let's look at half the fellow. Um, he was the vice president 
of public relations at the University of Notre Dame. And he was, his chief responsibility was raising funds for the university. And he was, a, he was an incredible fundraiser for the university. And he actually said at one point, he said, sometimes I get into difficulty because I don't understand how someone who has a close relationship with Notre Dame can refuse to devote his resources and energy to the place. I don't understand how someone who says, I love Notre Dame, I'm all about Notre Dame, doesn't ever show up, doesn't, doesn't volunteer, doesn't talk about, doesn't support financially. He said, sometimes I actually get a little aggressive in certain situations. I have to be careful not to overdo it, right? Maybe that's why he was a prolific fundraiser. But um, the, the truth is this, money tells your story. It really is like this, money is a mirror. Money says the truth about you. Money says the truth about me. So I, I can say I love, I, I can say that I, I, I love my wife, but if I don't spend money on her, well, you know. I can say that I, that I love exercise, but if I don't spend any money on exercise, well, I can say that I love to learn, but if I don't spend any money on classes or books, you might could question my commitment to learning. I could say that I love to build things, but if I don't spend any money on tools, you might be able to question my priorities. Money tells the truth. It's a mirror that reflects who you are and what you really believe is important. So Jesus had a saying, and it, it went like this. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we could say it like this. Where your money is, there your heart will be also. Or another way to say it would be like this. Your money will go where your heart is. So the things that you think are important, your money will eventually find its way there. The things that are priority in your life will eventually have your money. So a while ago, um, I don't know, a couple years ago, I had a guy who um, does, does not go to this church, so you know, don't try to guess who it is, but um, he reached out to me and said, um, how does a pastor like you uh, live in the house that you live in? Now, I have a nice house, but it's not elaborate, okay? I'm not going to end up on the news for my house. Uh, some of you have been at my house, okay? Um, it's a great house. I love my house. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not anything extraordinary. I, live in a, I just love my house. But um, it is big enough to hold eight people, right? Um, but he just said, how does a pastor like you have a house like that? And at first I got mad. And so I didn't respond immediately. Um, but I began to reflect on it, and we had a conversation that kind of went like this. This is how I choose to spend my money, right? Um, I'm a family of eight, and we have one car. I'm a family of eight, and um, we don't eat out a lot. I'm a family of eight, and our clothing budget is probably significantly less than maybe some of you in the, even in this room, right? Um, and it's a decision that we've made. Now, as I began to talk to this guy, I, I pointed out to him, I said, you know, um, I've seen you on social media, and I realized that um, every time you show up on social media, you've got a different hat on, which ironically matches your shoes. <laughs> and I've noticed that you have headphones that, that cost more than I spend on the entire clothing budget for my family in a handful of months. It's okay. You're a big boy, you can do whatever you want with your money. But your money says what's important to you, right? So, as we talked about this, I mean, ironically, um, this guy uh, lived in a mobile home with his mom, no joke. Not dogging, just saying he chose to spend his money on shoes that were more expensive. I probably could have taken his shoe budget and bought shoes for my entire family, right? No, again, not dogging him, it's just how he chose to spend his money. But the way you spend your money says what's important to you. He prefers shoes over his own place. 
He preferred expensive headphones over his own freedom. I've said, I want a, I want a house where my family is, is comfortable and can play and be safe. I prefer that over a brand new or multiple vehicles. It's my choice, right? Nobody's judging anybody. It's just the basic truth that where your money is, there your heart will be also. Money tells a lot about you. So the truth is this. You can spend your money on red shoes, or if you want to, or you could spend a welcome to my house. Okay. Because the truth is this. Your money will go where your heart is. You can tell everything you need to know about yourself by the way you use your money. So, sometimes people have this tendency to think, well, if I got more money, um, <coughs> I, would, I would do things differently. I would change. Well, W.C. W. Fields said, a rich man is nothing more than a poor man <coughs> with money. So the truth is this. This is important. Money doesn't change me. It just liberates me to, to buy what I've always wanted to buy. Money doesn't change me. It just liberates me to do what I've always wanted to do. Money doesn't change me. It just liberates me to become what I've wanted to become. The, the truth is this. Money doesn't, more money doesn't make you happy. It just makes you more of what you already are. If you're poor and generous, if you get money, you'll be rich and generous. If you're poor and a knucklehead, and you get money, you'll just be rich and a... <laughs> if you're poor and you love to fish and you get money, you'll be rich and love to... Money doesn't change you, it just makes you more of what you already are. And the truth is, what we do with our money tells us who we are. It's a mirror. It reflects what's important and what's valuable. And again, this is not, a, I'm not, I'm not pouring on, I'm not dumping, I'm not judging. If you want to live with your mom in a trailer and, and wear really expensive shoes that match your hat, and the next day wear another pair of really expensive shoes that match your hat, and the next day wear a really expensive pair of shoes that have matching headphones, that's completely up to you. It's completely up to you. But if I choose not to spend money on that, and to spend money and sit on a house, that's okay, right? It says what's important to me. That's what money does. So, we've heard this, this idea that money doesn't make you happy. Have you heard that? Well, I, I found somebody that said, look, I just want a chance. <laughs> let, me just, let me just try to prove that theory wrong, right? So, here's the truth. Um, money tells your story. It tells the truth about you. A thousand dollars in your hand would tell a different story than a thousand dollars in my hand. So, I mean, just for a minute, think about it. If you had a thousand dollars, as you walked out of the door today, it's not going to happen, by the way. We've given away all the money we're giving away today. But if on the way out of the door today, um, Tater were to give you one thousand dollars, every one of you, <laughs> Take just a second, how would you spend that? What would you do with that money? You ready? Think about it, because I want you just in a second to just tell the person next to you. If you had $1,000 today, what would you do with it? Three, two, one, go. All right. So some of you would take $1,000, you'd go eat out. Some of you would go buy some clothes. Some of you would put it in an emergency fund. Some of you would put it in an investment fund. Some of you would pay off debt. Some of you would go on a, on a trip. It doesn't matter. It's just, the point is, is that money tells your story. Now, I'm going to say this one more time because it's important. Money is a mirror. It tells the truth about you because it always goes where your heart is. Now, I want to tell you something. This is a really, 
really big deal. Here it is. If your money goes where your heart is, if your money goes to ultimately find its way to the things that are priority in your life, then it would stand to reason that you can change your heart by redirecting your money. If your money always goes to where your heart is, then it would stand to reason that you can begin to change your heart by redirecting your money. Now the thing about that is, that is a huge act of faith. <coughs> that is a huge risk to take, because you might think, what if, you know, what if I were to, to take my money and to begin to put it into something else, to spend it on a different set of activities, to spend it or invest it, to save it. What if I were to do that and it didn't change my heart? It's a huge act of faith to make that decision. So Jesus says this in Matthew 6, 33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And read that last line with me, please. He will give you everything you need. So basically Jesus is saying, look, I, I want to teach you something. I, I want to teach you to make God a priority in your life. Follow the teachings of Scripture. Follow the teachings of Jesus. And watch God take care of everything else that you need. Now that is scary. To actually put God first in our finances. And I'm not doing the tithe talk. I'm not doing that. I'm just saying to give God space in our finances is significant. Some of us struggle, some people struggle spiritually because your heart isn't into God. Your money goes where your heart is. Maybe your heart is a brand new house. Maybe your heart is a new car. Maybe your heart is travel. Maybe your heart is a hobby. And, and, and God gets what's left over. Jesus says this, the quickest way to change your heart is to believe in me and rearrange your budget. Because where your heart is, there your money will be. Does that make sense? Amen. Moving your money around is the quickest way to change your heart. And a decision like that requires a serious conversation and confidence in a person or an idea. And, and Jesus positions himself as that person. So if we were sitting at a cup of, over a cup of coffee and, and we were having this conversation, you might say to me, if I, if I redirect my money, I'm going to have to change my lifestyle. <clears throat> yep. If, if I redirect my money, I'm going to have to, I may have to give some things up. Yep. If, if I redirect my money, I'm going to have to add some line items into my budget. Yup. That's called a 180. And that's what Jesus does. He, he turns things around. He says, listen, I want to come into your life and, and I want to transform your heart. He actually said this in Matthew chapter 11. He said, look, Come to me, excuse me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Now, a couple of weeks ago I threw out this, this question on, on Facebook and I asked this question. I said, what does the word debt, what feelings does the word debt generate inside of you? And, and there were feelings like stress and, and heaviness and anxiety and frustration and, and, and um, despair and just on. Like, I think this could almost be applied to people who are struggling financially. Come to me, all of you who are, say it with me, weary and carry heavy burdens. And Jesus says, I will give you rest. So Jesus' invitation is, if you come to me, and you bring all of your stresses, I'm going to give you rest. Now, here's how he does this. Look what he says. Take my yoke upon you. Uh, first of all, let's talk about yoke. Uh, 
Jesus was not a sloppy eater, okay? So sometimes when I think about um, take my yoke upon you, I, I think about eating breakfast with someone, and they're a sloppy eater, and you get their egg in your lap. That's not what Jesus meant by take my yoke upon you, all right? Um, nor is Jesus calling us cattle. Because oftentimes when we think about, I know growing up as a kid, when I would hear this, take my yoke upon you, I'm like, that doesn't sound pleasant in any way. You're going to put a big wooden thing on my neck, right? Remember those yoke? You've seen those things like they would put on oxen? And, and that, again, is not what Jesus meant at all. Let me, let me read it again. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. Because I'm humble and gentle of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You know what a yoke was? Back in the day, there were multiple schools of thought when it came to religion and God. And, and every leading teacher had what was called a yoke, which was his teaching. So there would be the school of, of John, and there would be the school of Gamaliel, and there would be the school of Peter, and then there was the school of Jesus. And each one of these taught their own philosophy of life. And that teaching was called a yoke. And Jesus essentially is looking at people who are struggling and they're tired and they're wore down and they're burdened. And he said, look, come to me, I'll give you rest. Take my teaching, embrace my teaching, and I'll give you rest. I read that, you know what I realize? Is there's so many people walking around anxious and burdened and weary and worn out because of money. And Jesus says, if you'll come to me, and you'll believe in me, and you'll let me change your heart, I can eliminate to a surprising degree the stress and the frustration in your life. But here's what we've got to do. To change your heart, we've got to redirect some of that money. Matter of fact, we've got to rethink all of it. Because the way we spend our money tells the story of what's important in our lives. Now... I would say that a lot of you in this room have made a decision to come and follow Jesus. Some time ago in your life, you said, you know what, I, I believe in Jesus, I'm going to follow him. Um, and, and today, you do not value or prioritize what you used to value. You do not prioritize what you used to prioritize. But unfortunately, back in the day, you made some decisions that have bound you financially. And as a result, you've got stress or you're weighed down. I mean, this is what Proverbs says. We talk about this verse all the time. Proverbs 22, 7. The borrower is a servant to the lender. So back in the day, you made some decisions that made you a servant to Sally Mae or to American Express or to Bank of America or to MasterCard or to Visa or to Kohl's or wherever your debt lies. Back in the day, you made some decisions that have enslaved you, and they are now running your present, and they will control your future unless you do something. I just want to be a guy, and I want our church to be a church that figures out how to set ourselves free from bad decisions in the past. Is that good? You agree with that? How do we set ourselves free from bad decisions that we made in the past? And one of the quickest ways is to begin to rethink and redirect what resources we have available to us. And so for that reason, that's why we want to offer this Wednesday night at 180 University. We want to offer a teaching, a free teaching. Dave Ramsey teaches and fires us up about how to get out of debt. And you know the principles he uses come straight from God's Word. And I would just encourage you, if you're one of those people that's weary and you're heavy burdened and you're stressed and you're frustrated with the debt, with the financial in your life, would you please come Wednesday night at 7 o'clock? This will be an inspiration. It will be encouragement. And you'll find a community of people that are on the same journey as you. Now, we want to be free from the decisions we made in our past. Jesus says, listen, I, I can change your heart if you'll come and you'll follow me and you'll believe me and you'll trust me. So here's, here's what I want to do. I, as a church, I want us to be so honest I do not want to be a church that's fake. I do not want to be a church where we come together on Sunday, we, we, we play the religious game, and, and then we just, on Monday, we just forget everything we faked on Sunday. Let's just be real. Can we do that? Let's be honest. But here's the thing. 
I don't want to be having the same honest conversation six months from now that we're having today. Right? Wouldn't it be cool to see Jesus growing us up? Wouldn't it be cool as, as all of us, as we pursue Jesus and, and we learn about him and we trust him and he leads us, that our lives begin to evolve and, and our finances look different, but more importantly, our hearts look different. Our faith is bigger. Our family's better. We have a vision from God that's transforming our entire lives. I mean, listen, you, you've, heard, you've heard these conversations. Maybe you've had these conversations. I don't know. But it's one thing to sit down and say, man, I'm really struggling with this in my life. And six months or a year later, still be having the same conversation. At some point, don't you want to say, dude, and it can't say that, church. Uh, dude, come on, right? Uh, stop. Let's be, the, the truth is, Jesus said, I can, I can help you if you will trust me. You'll follow my teachings, believe in me. And one of the things we're going to do is rethink finances. Because finances talk about our heart. If I change my money, I can begin to transform my heart. Now, my question for you, and then we're just going to take some text questions. And then we're going to go and, uh, I don't know, whatever you do on Sundays. Some people beat, beat the Baptist to Mose and some people after this sermon aren't going anywhere but straight home, right? Now, Here's my question. What does the money meter say about you? What does the money meter say about you? What does your money and the way you spend it, if, if I were to look at your budget, or someone else were to look at the way you spend your money, what would they conclude is important to you? If you were to, to get behind the scenes and look at the way I spend my money, what would you conclude is important to me? Because remember, where your money is, your heart will be also. Having said that, some people made decisions in the past, and they don't value anymore because of their transformation that Jesus is doing in their life. They don't value anymore what they used to. Now they're struggling with the weight of bad decisions. And, and again, I just want to encourage you, if that's you, please, please, be a part of Wednesday night. You'll be encouraged and inspired. All right, we're just going to take a couple questions here, all right? Well done. Someone sent me that text. Now, okay, so someone... Um, and I don't, I don't want to argue too much about this. Uh, I'm going to say this. I, someone said, I want to point out that the Fields quote is not at all accurate. Um, it is a poor man's... Can you guys put that Fields, W.C. Fields quote back up there? It's a poor man's way of looking at money. People who become wealthy and stay wealthy have different habits than those who stay broke. Sure, agree with that. Right, but I, I think the point that is being made and the point that he was making, can we? it doesn't make sense until the quote's up there, I guess. Okay, well, basically Field says that, um, there it is. A rich man is nothing but a poor man with money. Essentially, what Fields is saying is that um, when a poor man gets money, he does what he wants, he, what he's always wanted to do. Because the truth of the matter is simply this, that money doesn't change us, it just liberates us to become and to do what we've always wanted to do. So, um, here we go, another question. How do you get your family on the same page financially? This is a great question. <coughs> or agree to make cuts of those extra items. Hey, I'll just tell you this. Um, this is where uh, long conversations and um, lots of prayer help. Um, getting together. Dave Ramsey, I listen to him, okay? And uh, Ramsey has to feel this question all the time. Like, how do I get my husband to do this? How do I get my wife to do this? I mean, some of this stuff... Um, takes a lot of time, a lot of prayer. Some of it takes just some difficult conversations. Interestingly enough, um, in, in two weeks, we're going to start a series on how Christians do conflict. Because I've noticed that if we're not careful in the church, when there's conflict, we avoid it, or we leave, or we scream and yell and raw, and nobody gets better. There is a, there is a, there is a great way for Christians to handle conflict. We're going to talk about it in two weeks doing a series called Let's Get Ready to Rumble. That'll be fun. Um, but the truth is, is getting your family on the same page just takes some time. 
And um, I would encourage lots of conversations. I would encourage prayer. Um, in addition to uh, participating in Financial Peace University, um, <laughs> perhaps even some conversations with uh, some mentors would be helpful. So, all right, uh, that's it. So here's what I want to do. Uh, we had uh, we had somebody send something stupid. That was actually what the quote said. Something stupid. That's actually what they sent me. Nice. Um, <laughs> some clarification on a quote and a great question. So I want to pray for us because I, I believe that God wants to wants to do something in our church. And it starts with our hearts. So when we talk about money, it's more than a money talk. It's a heart talk. Because where our heart is, there our money will be also. And so let's have this conversation. Jesus.